Praise the name of Jesus. Well, I want you to open up your Bibles today to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And we're going to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to speak with you today about the origin of family because there are a lot of people confused out there about what that is. Amen. Now, they shouldn't be. Right. And to be honest with you, for generations beyond, uh, rather before now, uh, we weren't confused. But there is a lot of confusion going on out there about what family is really all about. And so we want to get that confusion out of the way. Why? It's simple. Because God is not the author of confusion. Amen. He says, let all things be done decently. That's a huge word. And in order. Amen. And also, let me uh, tip our hat to our music, worship, and arts department, the voices of praise. Give them a good hand. Would you please praise the Lord? All right. Every institution of sorts that we are dealing with as humanity is under attack. It's been under attack. And uh, it, I, I, I wish I could tell you that the attacks will cease, but that does not seem to be the outcome in the foreseeable future. But I mean, the very foundations of our institutions are under attack. The family is one of them. Our educational system is another one. Our political system is another one. The marketplace is another. I mean, listen, everywhere you turn, every, quote, institution, everything that is structured or ordered or organized f to accomplish certain purposes are under attack. And the attack is without a doubt coming from Satan. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Because if you don't think it's coming from him, then you are, you are already deceived. And Jesus told you, let me tell you, first thing, see that no man deceive you. And then the second thing he said, what? Be not troubled. See that you be not troubled. This was Jesus' response to his own hand-picked disciples when they asked him when he was coming back and when would the end of all things occur. Now, Jesus never gave them a time or a day. He said, that's left in the hands of the Father. He said, no man knows the day or the hour that those occurrences will happen uh, except the Father. So it, God Almighty, the Father, holds exclusively that particular information. Amen. Now, you know, I don't get into meaningless arguments about, well, why didn't he share it with the Son, and why didn't he share it with the Holy Ghost? He's God. If you can answer that question, apparently you're God. So I don't even wrestle with stuff like that. Paul wrote in the New Testament that we need not weary ourselves fooling around with stupid questions about genealogies and things that have absolutely no relevance or pertinence to our spiritual well-being. That's what I was telling you last week. You know, the people ask, well, where did, uh, somebody asked, where did Cain get his wife from? And all. I mean, what's that going to do for you now? Amen. <laughs> you, you know, it's thousands of years ago, man. What, what is that going to do for you now? If you, if you had the answer, what would you do with it? And if the, th stop for a minute. How smart is God? If, there, if the relevance, if that was an important question to address and to answer, don't you think he would have had, come on somebody, Amen. God would have unloaded that in, in the Bible somewhere, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. Amen? Amen. Now, even Jesus himself said, and Paul also noted, that look, the Old Testament was written for an example for us who live in New Testament times. Amen. Amen. But there's only so much that came out of that. Now, I turn you to Genesis 18 because I really want to unlock this thing. Now, you know, I pray and I say, God, grant me the ability to speak boldly without fear, without favor, and without respect of persons. Now, it doesn't mean I don't have respect for people. But when it comes down to dispensing the truth, I want to tell you something. Love is the qualification for speaking the truth. Amen. Say that with me. Love, Love is the qualification for speaking the truth. Absolutely. When you love folk, you tell them the truth. Now, you may have to be tactful about it. 
you, you, you know, you may have to understand a little bit about how to approach, but see, that's the reason why I've taught you for years. Learn how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so you don't just go charging into a place like a bull in a china closet. But there's, there's a tactful way to bring the truth out. But listen, we're not doing anyone a service, a favor, or a, bringing advantage to them or benefiting them by not telling them the truth. And the truth I'm talking about is not truth I've made up or truth you've made up Amen. or truth other pundits or whoever out there uh, have made up. I don't care whether they're, they're uh, what do you call it, professors, teachers, uh, politicians, business people. Hey, you can't make up your own truth because right, right. the Bible says there is only one truth and it identifies that one truth as a person. Amen. That's right. And that person is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Or let me just sum him up. I said, Jesus, the son of the living God, Amen. the only Amen. begotten son yes. of the living God. Amen. All the rest of us come in by adoption. <laughs> he is the only begotten of the father. Remember the story? Come on, everybody. The Holy Spirit, yes. over the angel came and said, Mary, you're highly favored. <laughs> and you are going to bring forth the son. Mary, how am I going to do this? Seeing I've known not a man. You see, you don't have to worry about any of that. He said, the spirit of the most high God is going to overshadow you, and that thing that comes forth from you shall be called the son of God. And God planted the seed of himself in her, and she brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus of Nazareth. He was identified with the hometown, so to speak, Amen. even though he was born in Bethlehem. But they ended up living in Nazareth with what was supposedly his parents, Joseph and Mary. And of course, he also had brothers and sisters because Mary did indeed have other children. And this, the Bible makes this very, very clear. But I want you to notice, you know, sometimes we, we some things better caught than taught. If you notice from the very beginning, how did God set up the family? Okay, I turn to Genesis 18. I'm going to backtrack here just a little bit. Okay, so let's go back to Genesis. Uh, I'm going to come back to the 18th chapter because there's some things, some work we got to do in there. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Because here God has created everything. and At the end of the, the work, he said it's all good. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so, uh, pardon me, Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. So we're right in the first chapter of Genesis. Now, I remind you from something I said last week. It does not say in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning you. It doesn't say in the beginning this fellow over there or this lady over yonder. No, it says in the beginning God. You see, if you don't establish what's going on from the very beginning, you're going to go off trajectory. That's the reason why sinning against God, by literal definition from the Greek translation of the word sin, means missing the mark. Missing the mark. And God gives us the mark right from the very beginning because he says, in the beginning, God, that's it. That's all really you need to know. Wrestling about, now I, I thank God for a bit of the light that he's given me concerning what the beginning was like. I, I'm not speculating. Much of it is certainly revelation knowledge from the spirit of God. In terms of, see, for one thing, no one, the Bible doesn't even define how long the beginning is. In the beginning, who knows how long it was? Nobody knows. Then what does God do? Well, he creates a man in a full-grown state, as you and I know this day. Amen. The first man that he made was not born of a woman. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Come on. What? Come on. He wasn't born of a woman. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The plural pronoun is in reference to God the Father, God the Son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, 
who Jesus described in John's Gospels, chapters 14, 15, and 16, talking about the Holy Spirit now, as being another comforter. In other words, one called alongside to help and assist. Jesus also went into depth about what the Holy Spirit's mission was. Basically to do what? Lead us and guide us into the what? See, that's what's up for grabs now. That's the battle now. The battle is for the truth. I've been saying this for years. The battle is for the truth. Now, we're, we're looking at different things that are going on in our culture, in our society around us. We say, well, that's not right. That's what, what, what. See, what the issue is, is once people begin to try to de redefine the truth, they get into all kinds of trouble. Just because something has been made legal <laughs> doesn't necessarily make it lawful. Let me say that one more time. Just because somebody makes something legal does not necessarily mean it is lawful in the context of what the truth is. Amen. The truth, hold on a minute, the truth, that's God in the person of Jesus and the written word of God. The truth essentially establishes the plumb line for everything. And the problem is when you begin veering away from the truth, you are not only destined to miss the mark, meaning sin and transgress and do wrong, which can also uh, evolve into evil and wickedness because, man, it, it, just, it just sort of snowballs along. Are you listening to me? Everybody's wondering about little sins and big sins and this kind of sin is sin, man. Sin, <laughs> it's missing the mark. And, you know, I know some of you out there, but I, I, I'd never tell a lie. I've never told a lie in all my life. And you already just lied. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Pat. I, I, I grew up. I never heard my mom or daddy lie. I never heard my grandparents tell a lie. Never. No, 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 no. Now, I know y'all are not going to like me behind this. But, you know, have you ever been in a situation where you've been trying to justify yourself and you go to saying everybody's doing it? You just lied. Because there's no way in the world, now, you know, now some people are going to, please, save your negativity because I'm not interested in that. I, I have one mission to proclaim the truth of the gospel, all right? Now, now here's what I'm saying to you because nobody's going to stand before God and justify themselves. <laughs> Who is he that justifieth? It's Jesus. Man, I'm so glad that God has established that by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. What is it? It is the gift of God. God didn't present grace to you and say, how much can you put down? Y'all wake up in here. Come on now. Has God, listen, has an angel showed up at your doorstep? Hey, here's a package of grace from God. He wants to know how much can you put down and how much can you afford to pay every month? Grace is not on an installment plan. Grace is never discounted. Grace, listen, you cannot put in market terms anything about grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, which is not of yourself. You couldn't even manufacture it. God gave you everything you needed to escape this damnation in this world. He said it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But yet you got folks talking about how many works you've done versus how many works they've done versus how many works so-and-so has done. And none of that's going to stand. Everybody's work's going to be judged. Scripture says so. Some are going to have works that stand. Others are going to be burned up. But they themselves, the Scripture said, will remain saved. Now, that's not an invitation to do nothing. But, I want you, but the point is, look, when you recognize and realize what a wonderful thing this is that God has done for us, man, I tell you what, you, you're one of, ready to be one of those people that said, let me let my light shine so that others may see my good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven. Amen. But now let me get back to this thing about lying. Because as soon as you start talking about what everybody said, well, everybody's doing this now, you're lying. You cannot justify that. 
Now, I'm not saying you intended to lie. I'm not saying that, you know, you, listen, that's why the scripture said, let God be true. And every man a liar. Because if you read the scripture, God doesn't make that mistake. Whatever God says, listen, if he said it, he will do it. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. He has put his word above his own name because that's why his name is good. Because his word is good. Not 99 and a half percent of the time, but a hundred percent of the time. Now, we got a set of doors over there that's painted white. And I want to tell you something. If that door being white, and I'm, I'm just using the color white in terms from the context of the scripture, which essentially illustrates or indicates the total absence of sin. Remember what God said in Isaiah, it, though, come, come let us reason together. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, but scarlet is a stark color. You can't miss it. <laughs> Especially you put it on a white background, man, scarlet stands out. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Let me explain something to you. You know something? I guarantee you, if you go over there and look hard enough at that door, you're going to find a speck somewhere. And if there is a speck on the door, it's not all the way white. Because there's something on it. So when you go to arguing about big sins, little sins, and medium-sized sins, if you got a pinprick over there that, that, listen, in any way prevents that door from being made completely solid white as the color was chosen for it, it has missed the mark. As good as we think we are, as nice and kind as we think we are, there's something left to be desired. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, I ain't coming here to give you a message to condemn you because, look, all you have to do is know what? What am I talking about? The truth. And the truth says there is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. How do you know when you're in Christ? The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things. Everybody say all. all. I love it. All things are become new. That becomes our status when we come into Christ. Now, let me, let me explain that. Let's back into it. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, the Holy Spirit is, is dealing with me. Every little baby born in the world is perfectly a human being. Science, biochemists, and all this, and you know, figuring out how how do you take the sperm from a male and the egg from a female? You can't even about see them. You can't see them really not with the naked eye. They come together and poof and voila, here you are. And 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 inside those two tiny microscopic subatomic particles, not quite subatomic, but is all you. That's right. Amen. Your nose shape is in there. Yeah. Your hair texture's yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> Each one of your toes. Some oh, folks got man. weird looking feet. You ever seen people? <laughs> Nobody really cares about that, you understand? It ain't nothing you can do about that. Right. Most of you try to fix up what people can see. You know, nip tuck. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Put a little paint on and whatever. You, you, you know, you, you try to fix up what you figure most people can see. Rest of it doesn't matter, so to speak. Amen. But, but now, you, listen, going back. And so these two, listen, these two cells come together, the sperm cell and, and the, the, the egg from the woman. And when, they, when, when, the, when the sperm penetrates the egg, boom, conception begins. Conception begins. In other words, the beginning of the shaping and the forming of a human being Amen. begins. Yeah. If you all remember just simple old biology, you would take it when you were about 
eight or nine years old, just about, you know, he told you how it multiplies as I go, this, that, the other, and then eventually, you know, you see the form taking shape. Now, we've been dealing with, for the last couple of years, whose lives matter. My question to you is, those lives that haven't gotten here yet into the world, do they matter? Let me tell you how they matter. God told Jeremiah, before you were formed, wait, wait a minute now, hold on just a minute. Before you were formed, now I don't think you understand the depth of that expression. God's talking about before your mama met your daddy. Before, you know what before means? It means before. You were formed in your mother's womb. God said, I knew you. You were intimately in the creative matrix of my mind. I know, God says, the end of a thing from its beginning. You don't think so? Remember the angel? that went out there when Hagar was cast out of the camp by Sarah. You know, there's a little family feud going on here. And so he said, get this bomb woman out of here. And man, Hagar ran off. You know, she was outdone and all this, but she was pregnant. Amen. Angel shows up and said, Hagar, what's your problem? Well, and you know, he, she went into her little litany. He said, well, look, you, you're, you're great with child. And uh, let me tell you something about him. God's going to tell you about your kid That's right. by the angel. Now, now, listen, God can, God can communicate on a number of ways, in a number of levels, but listen, he sent the angel to bring this word. This child you're carrying, his hand is going to be against every man, and every man's hand is going to be against his. This is going to be a wild fellow. And he's telling her that before the child even gets out of the womb. What is it that God doesn't know about you? If God can number the very hairs on your head in the openings for those of you that don't show any. How do you figure he doesn't know what's going on in your life? And see, this, this is the puzzling thing because somebody that knows all that, you ought to depend on, rely on, and count on because he can always be depended on, always be relied on, always be counted on. I can't say that for myself. I can't say that for you. And you can't say it for anybody else you know. Amen. But you can say that for God. That's right. Amen. When the scripture says that God is faithful, the promise? Yeah, absolutely. You ever raise children or grandchildren? You, you know, you promised them something, but for something came up and you couldn't do it. Well, see, your kids don't know the difference between the, a broke, the, amen, the truth, a broken promise and a lie. They don't know the difference. But you, 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 you you didn't have the intent to lie to him, but you had to break the promise because you had a priority that exceeded that for whatever reason. Now, of course, you have opportunity to go back and make it up to the kid or whatever and that, that kind of thing, but, but you don't need to sit there and beat yourself up and get into self-pity and begin to condemn yourself over that situation. Now, but, but listen, this is why God had to provide for us what he did, how he did, when he did through Jesus from the time man fell in the garden of Eden God knew he was going to be messed up he was messed up from that point and, and with the generations of humanity in him it was going to fall on them as well now you know I like to argue sometimes you know Obviously, what God says about us, and I think about the question the psalmist asked him, what is man that you are so mindful of him? He goes on, he said, you made him a little lower than the angels, but the word angels in that eighth psalm is the word or the name Elohim. In other words, you made him a little lower than yourself. We're not made lower than the angels, we're made a little lower than God. And see, that, that's revelation knowledge imparted to the psalmist to record it in the book of Psalms. 
We said, what is man that you're so mindful of him? You made, listen, this is deep because that's why God didn't pull out a giant eraser and erase us. Since Adam messed up and fell in the garden along with Eve, you figure God pull out a man, let me, you know, like he's drawing a cartoon character. Wait, let me just erase that and start over again. Maybe Walt Disney said, man, I ain't make Mickey's ears big enough. Let me erase it and start over. But God didn't do that with us. Man failed a great failure. Man sinned a great sin by rebelling against God and turning away from him and completely disobeying him and transgressing against him and committing high treason. All of that stuff would be typically punishable by death. Look, when they catch spies in, in these countries years ago during the World Wars, at any time, almost throughout human history, where, where there were great civilizations contending for territory and, and power and this and that and the other, anybody who was considered a traitor or a spy would typically be put to death Here's a man named Adam who was given the authority and the title of being the God of this world and he betrayed and he literally rebelled against God. Glory to God. You know, in, in the upshot of it, God didn't put him to death. He put himself to death. Because God told him, look, I don't want to do anything. It, it, this, is, this is a testament to the fact that God's system is always in place. Amen. It's like he is from everlasting to everlasting. That's why he said, look, in the day that you touch this fruit or you eat of it, you will surely die. Amen. God didn't say, you know, when I catch you messing with the fruit, <laughs> I'm coming down here with a big razor and slice your throat. No, he's not doing that. I'm coming down here with a big club and beat you over the head till you're dead. No, 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 no. Adam suffered death by a self-inflicted action. That's right. That's right. And I'm sorry to have to report to you that the same method and means is taking folks out to this day. Amen. You can't blame God. Amen. You can't blame the devil. If you don't believe me, go back to the scenario in the garden. Adam, where are you? Woman, what is this that you've done? What does she do? The serpent beguiled, the serpent beguiled me. She blamed the devil. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, she certainly was deceived, but the devil didn't force feed her. That's right. Amen. He didn't grab her by the wrist and say, grab this fruit, baby, isn't this good? Yeah. No. No, 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 no. He talked to her. That's right. Amen. He suggested to her. I'm telling you that what you are watching unfold in the world around you today and in our human cultures all over the world when you see crime and wrongdoing and evil doing and lying and cheating and stealing and all the rest of it, you are witnessing individuals who have taken the suggestions of Satan. None of us wants to think that way. None of us wants to believe that way, but this dude has been doing this for a long time. And see, you, it, it was purposeful that God showed us the picture of how it happened. He usurped the body of a serpent. When was the last time you saw a snake that could talk? Don't answer that question. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. Amen. And he, you know, he, he must have been rather appealing. Because you, there was quite a little conversation that they had when you read the account of it. All right. But let me, let me back up here. I didn't mean to go that far into the, the sidelines here. Okay. So God said, verse 26, chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man our image after our likeness and let them, notice all the plurality, let them. So God is letting you in on the fact that there's going to be more than one. Amen. That's right. Good. See the word man there in that 26th verse where he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. This was the mankind. This was going to be the race of men. We're battling over race on the basis of colors. But God only made one race. 
of humanity. Now, how we divest it into colors, I don't know, and I don't care. And it, and it doesn't matter. But for some reason, the appearance of one color or another on humanity affects our visual and mental and all these physical faculties for whatever reason. And the enemy gets a chance to suggest to the minds of people who look at others through the lenses of racial prejudice, they're less than you. They're more than you. There are no equals. This is this. This is that. I told you I had to speak without fear, favor, respect, or prayer. Because the Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. Yes, right. Amen. Now, there, you know, I, I don't, listen, I don't have time to make a whole bunch of disclaimers and stuff like that. I, I can't keep up with all the letters these folks are coming up with. I just call them alphabet folks. LGB, QT, I don't know how many more. They may add a few more. I don't know. So I just, I just truncated it down to alphabet. All right? Now, you know, look, I didn't call you an epithet. And yet many of us have been called epithets. And we've, and listen, just, let's get real. Some of us have called other, quote, races of people epithets. And then, even then we, we're marching around talking about whose lives matter. Well, I want to know who can account for this. Well, you can't even count them up. Who knows? Maybe, it's, you, know, they, you know, look, the official tally, they say, that have been aborted is about 60 plus million. Yeah, yeah, 60 plus million that were reported. What about the ones that weren't reported, that weren't tallied as a statistic? There may be 100, maybe 200 million that were what? Made in the image of God and after his likeness, who were destined to have dominion over the fish, the fowl, the creeps, and all that. But it was inconvenient to bring the baby in the world because I don't have time for that child. I got to get my schooling. Uh, I got to get to my destiny and my dream. And a child is just not in the picture, and people thought that's, at least, uh, let me put it this way, people allegedly <laughs> and reportedly thought that 60 plus million times. Now, it's, it's so quiet in here <laughs> that I can hear your eyelids bat. <laughs> and I'm only, listen, I'm, I'm only addressing and dealing with some real issues. And see, these issues absolutely warrant what we were studying in Romans 1, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men. All of it. You got to understand something. None of it is going to escape. The only escapees are those whose lives are hidden in God with Christ. That's the only escapees, or the evacuees, okay, is those of us that are in Christ. So, so if you did any of this stuff or, or anything else that I may deal with in, in the course of, you know, delivering this message, hey, <laughs> count yourself blessed that you've escaped. In fact, is it not written in 1 Peter? He says that, you know, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Glory be to God. Why? Because of God's promises. And God's redemptive plan, we escaped it. So, have you changed your mind about counting him faithful yet? You better, you better be glad he's faithful. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his promises. He, he, he is faithful. Thanks be to God. So, I mean, anything, listen, look, I, I want to tell you something. If you insulted somebody, <laughs> if you if you hit somebody, if you cut off somebody, if whatever you did, you better be thankful for the grace of God. 
I present it in this fashion to basically demotivate that part of us <laughs> that, that too easily falls into temptation of wanting to do that stuff. Yeah, all humans are tempted. Everybody is tempted. There's nobody that escapes that. Amen. Listen to me, from the most powerful right. to the last one that arrived right. a moment ago, Amen. all humans are tempted. Amen. There's no sin in being tempted. Right. It's when you yield to it. Lord, right. yes. It's when you, shall I put it in a, in, in a phraseology, it's when you bow your knee to it Amen. and say, you know what, I'll do it. But the Bible says that sin shall no longer have dominion yeah. over you. Yeah. you but we're not thinking about Come that on. at the moment. We forget when we're sinning that, that sin doesn't have any dominion over us. I mean, you can legally tell sin where to go. That's right. That's right. Amen. Now, now, there's a, now, there's some illustrations of that. And, and, you know, some people accuse me of being all over the Bible. That's okay. It's the Bible. Don't make any difference where, what part of it I land in. If I'm giving you the Bible, it's the Bible. I'm thinking about Joseph here. Since I'm in the book of Genesis, but he's a long way on in Genesis, like around 37th chapter there. Listen, let me tell you something. Uh, Joseph, when he was confronted with temptation by Potiphar's wife, you all remember that story? You know, Joseph uh, was a slave, sold out by his own brothers into slavery picked up by Ishmaelite traders. Isn't that bad, man? Your own cousins pick you up and say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they bartered with their cousins, man. Because see, well, see those were, they were Ishmaelites. Y'all remember? Ishmael? Ishmael? That's who the angel was talking about right. when he was speaking with Hagar. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's Ishmael in you, girl. Amen. And this is how he's going to be. His hand's going to be against every man, and every man's hand's going to be against his. And it was the Ishmaelite traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, traders. These guys were in business. Amen. They would go and, you know, buy slaves. And, that's what they, and so Joseph's brother said, hey, hey, you guys, where y'all heading, man? We, man, we're heading down to Egypt. Got a big sale going to be coming up in Egypt, man. We need some slaves. You got one? Yeah. Take this fellow here. Here's a boy. You, you don't understand, folks. This, this story goes way deeper than what we're looking at here. Yeah. Here's a boy that was deputized by his father, given a coat of many colors, which is a significant gesture of elevation of his status in the sight of the whole tribe. Amen. And yet, for how, so many pieces of silver, does the story sound familiar? <laughs> he, he, he was sold into bondage. But what? He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Can, do you think God just threw this thing together by accident? The, listen, the principles and the patterns are all over the scripture. Amen. Did not Judas betray the Lord and sell him out for so many pieces of silver? He came unto his own and his own received him not. Those are Joseph's own brothers. He came to them. Jacob sent him to go down there and see what your brother's doing. He came to his own and his own received not. They hated to see him coming. Here comes this dreamer. Amen. I'm tired of him. Let's get rid of him. Come on. Mm. Oh, oh, really? That's what he said about Jesus. Right. We're tired of him. It was his own. That's right. The religious folks, Amen. the scribes, the Pharisees, yeah. the Sadducees, Amen. all the people that were against him, those were his own. That's right. And he came unto his own. And his own received him not. You have to remember, the ministry of Jesus was primarily to the Jews. Now, the Gentiles happened to get blessing passing through. Like the centurion in Matthew 8. Remember him? He, he approached the Lord. Now, the, the centurion was a Roman. He's an Italian boy. Came to Jesus. Master, I got this. And this is why I told you, I can't prove it, but then you can't disprove it. Look, these soldiers were everywhere posted throughout Galilee and the Judea because they heard Jesus, man, was carrying out with these great campaigns and these great meetings, and thousands upon thousands of folks are coming. If anything makes an empire nervous is when you can get a bunch of people together right. at any one time because they don't know whether you're trying to take them over or what. Right. Amen. So Caesar had all kinds of guard posted. He had a governor there in Judea, Pontius Pilate looking over stuff. 
And so, you know, just, a, just out of happenstance, these boys had to do guard duty That's right. around all Jesus' meetings. That's right. They couldn't help but hear what he had to say. And what, what else do you know? What do you mean he, he, they couldn't help but hear what he had to say? They couldn't. Right. They're there listening. Right. Because, see, that's a part of their assignment. Right. <laughs> they're not just to stand there just to keep people from scrapping. They're there to hear what is this rabbi talking about that bringing all these folks out here. Because we got to make sure he's not telling them to rise up and rebel against Rome. Amen. So, see, Caesar himself didn't even know what he was assigning these boys to do. Go there and go listen. Yeah. And they did. Yeah. And they ran into an eternal principle outlined in Romans, the 10th chapter, that says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. If that's not true, my question to you is, why then did the centurion come to Jesus about a sick servant that he had at home and then Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. Yeah. But then the, sir, listen, the centurion says, hold it. I'm not even worthy that you should set foot in my house. However, I learned a few things. It, all you have to do is speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. A Roman centurion. Jesus was so stunned. Now, you, now you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just using words here. But Jesus stood up, and he said, wait a minute. He said, I haven't found this kind of faith in all of Israel. And you know, it's impossible for him to lie now. Right. Come on. Amen. I have, did you all hear this man? I haven't found this kind of faith in Israel. And the Lord said, go home. Your Glory. servant's healed. Glory to God. A man halfway to the house, somebody Glory. met him in the road. Hey, guess what? Glory. What? Your servant was here. About when? Same hour he was in there talking Glory to Jesus. To God. Glory, Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> uh, let me bring you all up to speed. This is the same Jesus. That is our Savior and your Savior. This is that same Jesus that walked to a tomb and told a dead man to come out. This is that same Jesus that when 10 lepers approached him, they wanted him to heal them. And he said, I, I, I will be, be thou cleansed. No one. Listen to me, in the biblical account, no one came to Jesus that he turned away right. for healing right. or for deliverance. Because, yeah. man, yeah. Jesus was healing all manner of yeah. diseases, all and Jesus glory. was casting out all kinds of demons yeah. out of folk. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. And the Bible says of, of all, of Jesus, in Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. So that's why Jesus said, see that no man deceive you. I know I'm sort of moving back. Listen, Amen. I'm still in the Bible now. Look, yeah. I see why Jesus said, see that no man deceive you and see that you be not troubled. Because see, listen, all the nonsense and craziness that was going on at the time where Jesus' earthly ministry was going on, this, our stuff has just evolved to another level. This is like Amen. chaos, calamity, and confusion 2.0. Amen. And I want to tell you something. It's no more going to stop Jesus now than it did then. Amen. They were under Roman occupation, and it seems like we're under sin's occupation. Glory to God. But it's not going to stop him. I told you, I'm just going to tell you, no promise, no principle of God's kingdom, no promise from God. Listen, everything, look, all the promises of God are in him, yay, and amen. So no matter how uh, what's the word I'm looking for? No, no matter how decadent the culture gets, it will not dissolve or dilute the word of God. You can still stand on that word. And I got to close because, look, I got to warn you. While you're, you and I are going through this culture, and we are, 
we're, we're dealing with it one way or another of necessity. We're in the marketplace doing what we do. We're raising our children and grandchildren in the midst of it all. And uh, we're having to deal with them coming home and telling us stuff that we know is not biblical, not scriptural, that in fact you wonder how in the world your child being so young knows anything about that anyway. And as a, listen, here's my point. The, the point is this, you, you, you kind of you pick up a little of that sawdust on you. And if you, it, listen, you, you got you to gotta sweep it off. I, this, I'm using figures of speech here. You know, it, it, I'm, I'm really talking about spiritual things, sort of the same way that Jesus did with Nicodemus. You, you got to sweep that stuff off because if you leave it on you, you, you mess around and get it absorbed into your own soul. They tell you the things that they've changed the truth of God into a lie over is what everybody's doing now. And remember what I was telling you about lying on the front end of this message. When they start telling you everybody's doing, they're already lying. Because everybody's not. Well, everybody believes this way. Well, this is the way it is. This is No, that's truth made up by a man. That's truth born of a man's pride. Something God hates feet being swift to running to mischief, something God hates. Evil imaginations, something God hates. Wickedness, something God hates. He doesn't hate you, he hates that. And that's what I'm trying to tell you now. Look, get tough in the spirit. Get your whole armor on. And don't ever take not one piece of it off. Because you're going to need it all. You're going to need it all in these times. You're going to need that shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked because, listen, you got to train your kids too because they're going to call your kids everything but a child of God because of their values and their beliefs and their convictions that you have taught them from God's Word. And so you got to get them ready for the little bullies and bullets. That's the female version. They're going to come with all this. And you have to, that's, what, that's why in Deuteronomy 6, it says, look, you take these children and you teach them these things. Because I'm telling you, your institutions of education and the marketplace and all these things are, are just shifting and changing. Man, I want to get to Genesis 18 so bad because, I don't know, y'all might have to hang over next service. I might get to it, but to see, because I'm going to unfold the nature and the character of this spirit of homosexuality. And how the Bible actually unfolds and shows you the nature, the traits, and the characteristics of that. I'm trying to stop. But I don't think I should deprive you of this principle. God underscored it so strongly in my spirit. I'm just going to share it with you and then I'll stop. You are living now in a culture that is absolutely showing you example after example of the principle of whatever the world can't control it will decriminalize and turn around and legalize I'll just leave it right there I'll have to pick that up in the next segment but I'm just saying I'll, I'll just leave that right there now if you've been wondering what does all this have to do with the family everything because all this stuff I was talking about this morning with you has impact on the family. How you discern truth from a lie has everything to do with the well-being of not only you, yourself, but also your family. And that's the word for the day, praise God. And I want to say to those of you that are tuned in to us by live stream and those of you that are here in the presence of our in-person service, maybe maybe, just possibly maybe, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And that's where it all begins. To get in on the redemptive plan of God, to become a part of God's family, to become a citizen of God's kingdom, and, and literally, and really, spiritually speaking, to be saved from your sin. Saved from your sin. To experience what it is like to have grace save you through faith. None of it of yourself. A gift from God. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. 
To experience that, you need Christ in your life. That is so easy. It's as easy as a prayer. But it's even more easy when you truly believe that prayer and do so out of the conviction of your own heart. So I want to lead you in a special prayer right now. So whoever you are, wherever you are, I'm just going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes for a moment, and just get, minimize any distractions that are around you. Father, we thank you that we may come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And now I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer from your heart to the heart of God because you have his attention and say, Dear God in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin, is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. I am now made a new creation in Christ, born again of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. If you prayed that prayer with us today, congratulations. Welcome into the family of God. And now you're officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We're so happy for you, so glad for you.